Hi my babies, welcome back to Younger. So today I'm going to discuss 10 things not to do for your skin. So before I move on, I ask that you like, comment, and subscribe to my page and share this video with anyone who may find it useful. So the reason why I wanted to talk about 10 things that are bad for your skin, and it may be more than 10 things, I'm gonna to try to keep track of these, but because these are not only skin myths, but things that you may read or see about online or see people doing, or may even be recommended by your provider. And it's my job to educate you and let you know why certain things are bad and not to fall into pitfalls that can actually harm your skin when you think that you're actually trying to help your skin. So to start off, I want to talk about microneedling. So microneedling is like a hot topic right now. I've talked about it in my other YouTube videos. And microneedling basically is a mechanical microneedling of the skin to traumatize the skin to stimulate collagen. Now, as a provider, I've seen a lot of patients with bad outcomes, suboptimal results. There's some transient inflammation. This is more when I'm talking about at-home devices like derma rollers, derma pens things that can create inflammation and temporary swelling that can make fine lines and wrinkles appear better, but are gonna have long-term effects like scarring, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, risk of infection, and I see this from patients who use these at-home devices and they come to see me, so I feel a moral obligation to kind of just let the truth out and tell you guys that there is just a transient inflammation which often makes fine lines and wrinkles look better. And if you look at the hard evidence, there's no evidence or research studies that have shown that at-home microneedling devices really work. And I'm talking about peer review literature from the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, from the Archives of Dermatology, JAMA, Nature, Science, all, the, all of the peer-reviewed published literature that doctors usually have access to because of our society memberships and our continuing medical education there's data that we look at when we're recommending certain devices or procedures or treatments for our patients and this is what we base our decisions on and what we recommend to our patients. So any influencer on Instagram can say use this derma roller at home and you'll look amazing and you'll look 20 years younger but there's no checks and balances to regulate that data and any third party can produce data and publish results that are hired by our company just for marketing. So you can spin statistics any, any way you want. And I've actually commented on this in one of my recent YouTube videos when someone was challenging me saying, well, this device works because there's this data supporting it. But when you look at those studies, those are paid published studies to spin data and statistics to make a device look like it's working when it really isn't. So again, my job is just to kind of educate you guys and to tell you not always to buy into what you see in a Google search or WebMD or some influencer who's promoting some at-home device that doesn't really work. Look at the hard evidence and just protect yourselves from bad things happening. That's not to say that some at-home devices work. Some of them do. Light stim, although it's not a medical grade device, can be helpful with reducing inflammation. The, I think it's the blue, red, amber lights can increase lymphatic flow, decrease inflammation, decrease P. acne's bacteria to improve acne. Now again, it's not gonna be as a medical grade potency, but at home, you know, as an at-home device, it can be useful. So other things that I wanted to discuss, um, using oils on your face. Now I know I'm a big proponent of that, and I've had lengthy discussions and videos on YouTube about oils and why moisturizers are bad for your face. When you put, I'm gonna to try to keep it simple and not to go into this too much because I don't wanna beat a dead horse or be redundant, but when you put oil or moisturizer on the surface of your skin, on the stratum corneum, which is the superficial most layer of the epidermis, which is on top of the dermis, you basically are telling the skin cells down below, hey, I'm greasy and oily and I have enough hydration, so stop holding onto water, stop hydrating yourselves, we're good. Those signal transduction cascades, when, you're, when your skin wants to hold on to hydration. All of your cells, your keratinocytes, your fibroblasts, your melanocytes, all the skin cells communicate with one each other. And when they feel that there's moisture or oil on the surface of the skin, they think they don't need to hold on to hydration. So what you need to do is stimulate your skin cells, your keratinocytes to hold on to water and to find water. And by doing that, you need Retin, Retin-A or vitamin A derivatives, you need antioxidants, you need C 
skin products, growth factors, things that are gonna make your skin cells retain water and hydrate themselves. So the reason why moisturizers and oils feel so great on the skin is because your fingers are touching the surface of the skin where the oil is just sitting on top of the skin and doing nothing for the overall skin health or hydration or water retention down below. So not to, again, beat a dead horse, but oils and moisturizers are bad for the skin. And when I say moisturizers, I mean creams and oils. Creams are a water and oil immersion. Lotions are a powder and water emulsion. And, and moisturizers are a little bit more heavy on the oil containing side. You wanna hydrate your skin and stimulate your skin cells to hold onto water. And sometimes paradoxically by doing that, by using something like a Retin-A, your skin can get red, dry, peely, and irritated, but the more you use it, the more tolerant your skin gets, the more hydrated it gets, the stronger it gets, the healthier it gets, and then you don't have that red, dry, peely reaction anymore, and you can get out of the shower and pat your face dry, and it's hydrated and supple and full, and, it's, and, it, and it feels healthy and it feels good, and it doesn't require makeup to hide anything or to mask anything. When you use an oil on your skin, the texture gets crappy, your pores get enlarged, you get sebaceous gland hyperplasia. I see this at the dermatologist clinically. When people are using oil on their face, their skin does not look good. When people are using antioxidants, hydrators, products that are gonna make their skin retain water and, and hydrate themselves, that's when their skin looks glowing, when it looks radiant and when it looks its best. Also, as a most cancer surgeon, when I look under skin under the microscope, patients who put oil on their face have these big old sebaceous foamy glands which dilate the, the little vellus hair follicles which open the follicular osteo or the pores and make you have blackheads and, and oily skin. That's not, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a misinformation when people say that oil is good for your skin. It's not. Don't let any influencer or someone who is not clinically trained tell you otherwise or try to sell you a product or they're trying to put oil or moisturizer on your skin. I was at Neiman Marcus buying a pair of shoes the other day and there were these oils that were in the cosmetic section that were five, six, seven hundred dollars. So not only is it bad for your skin, but it's taking your money, your hard earned money, and, and it's selling you something that's not only gonna not help, but it can actually harm your skin. Could cause pores, it's procomedogenic, it can cause acne. I'll stop talking about that subject, but no oils on the face or moisturizers that are greasy. You want hydrators only. Um, also, don't put products on your skin because they smell good or because the packaging's heavy or because the packaging looks amazing or they have like a fun marketing marketing label on there. You just, you don't want to use things and buy into the hype. I'm a sucker at Sephora and Ulta just like, at Ulta, just like you are. When I go there for my eye makeup and I go there for other, you know, other products, not makeup on my skin, because I try not to wear any makeup on my skin, just tits and sunscreen. But when you go there, there's so many different eye creams and, and neck creams and face creams and washes in there really beautifully packaged and I feel like my theory is the more beautifully packaged it is or the more expensive it is the worse it is for your skin because if the stuff really really worked you would need all those fancy packages and you wouldn't need it to have the, a fragrance or a smell that smells so good that's going to keep you addicted to using a cream or a product that doesn't work. So, and I know a lot of you guys have asked me to do a YouTube video where I go into Sephora or Ulta, so I'll try to work on that for you, but it gets a little bit dicey because, you know, pe people come up to you and ask you for help and you don't want to be throwing shade on their, you know, products or bad-mouthing them, so it gets a little bit risky, but I'll try to do that for you. Um, stickers on the skin, so Biore strips, adhesive, sleeping stickers, those ones that go on your chest to help with the intramammary creases or, or, or sleep creases or folds in the chest. Don't use that, you guys. When you take those adhesives off, it breaks the microscopic little capillaries and it, it, it causes skin laxity and it helps, it breaks down, not helps, it breaks down collagen. It can make your skin uh, loose and lax and doesn't help prevent sleep creases in the first place. So and a lot of those sleep stickers I've seen on Instagram ads for that, don't buy those. Those are just gonna stretch out your skin when you peel them off. It's gonna break the little microscopic telangiectatic blood vessels. It's gonna make you have broken blood vessels on your chest. It's gonna make things look worse. Biore strips, same thing. When you put them on your nose and you pull it off, 
I mean, yeah, you get a temporary, you know, release of the keratin plugs in your blackheads, which can open up your pores, but you're much better off using a scrub or using a complexion renewal pad with toners that are going to decrease pore size and deep clean out those pores. Also, using Clarin Brilliant Laser is going to decrease your pore size and kind of help deep clean those pores. You don't need to do a Bay or a strip because every time you pull that adhesive off, you're breaking those little capillaries and you're causing broken blood vessels in the skin. And it can also, it stretches the skin because as you pull it away from your face, it's going to decrease the elasticity, break down the elastin and collagen. So stay away from the BRA strips as well. Um, I used to use this in high school and I wish I had it. So, but we have BB laser to take those broken blood vessels away if you need to. Um, chemical sunscreens. Don't use chemical sunscreen, you guys, and don't get hung up on SPF. I know I've done a whole sunscreen video. You can check that one out too. But many people will come in and they'll say, I have brown spots, I have sun damage, and I use SPF 100. SPF only pertains to the UVB rays, which are important because those are the UV rays that cause skin cancer. I'm a skin cancer surgeon. Of course, I love the protection of UVB rays, but UVA rays are the rays that cause brown spots, sun damage, breakdown of collagen, premature aging, wrinkles, fine lines, crepey skin, decreased laxity, breakdown of elastin, all that stuff. So UVA rays are important in anti-aging. If someone's using an SPF 100, they're being protected from the UVB rays, but they're doing nothing for the UVA rays. So people will have full-blown melasma and they're using SPF 100 thinking that they're being protected, but they're not. You guys need mineral-based sunscreen. Chemical sunscreen is not good for your health anyway. You want zinc or titanium dioxide, 8% or higher. Somebody asked me a really insightful question. I think it was on my Instagram feed post or in a story um, or messaged me and they asked, well, what if both percentages equal 8? That's a good question. So the answer is no. If you have a zinc 5% and a titanium dioxide 3% and that adds up to 8, the one or the other has to be 8. If both of them are above 8%, great. But if zinc is 10% and titanium is 2%, then that's fine. But you want a mineral-based sunscreen. Mineral-based sunscreen blocks you from the entire UV spectrum. UVA1, UVA2, UVB rays, it blocks you from the entire UV spectrum. And they're natural, mineral-based, non-chemical sunscreens. So not only is it better protection, it's just healthier for you and it will block the UVA and UVB rays. So don't get hung up on SPF because a lot of people do and that's a big mistake that people make all the time. So when we see patients from melasma, we're doing peels and lasers and we get their melasma on point, say they're on HelioCare supplements and they're protecting themselves from the sun and they're not using a sunscreen that is protecting them without them knowing it, then they can get into trouble and the melasma can come back, the brown spots and dispigmentation, all that stuff. So just be aware of that. Um, and don't pick at your acne. So that's another thing that you want to avoid that could be bad for your skin. So picking acne causes post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. It can also cause wound contraction. So you get these little uh, almost semi-muscle fiber, semi-collagen proteins in the skin and it can contract once you pick and it can cause a divided scar. It can also cause a post-inflammatory hyperpigmented scar. That just means when your melanocytes, which are the pigment producing cells, get traumatized by picking it can release pigment and can make the acne scars darker or it can cause a wound contraction that's going to make those divided scars. Those are the hardest to get rid of because of the textural irregularity. It's a topography of the skin and usually you need fractionated lasers to help resurface the skin with pigmented scars from um, acne picking just with uh, a brown discoloration but no texture regularity, that's a little bit easier to get rid of. You can use a hydroquinone, you can use a non-hydroquinone bleaching agent like Lytera 2.0, you can use a YAG, you can use a Q-switch, you can use a fractal permea, you can use different lasers to kind of lighten those brown spots also. But picking also causes redness, redness usually turns to brown and it can scar. So just um, the better thing to do is just to avoid it and just kind of get to the root cause of the acne. Usually when patients come in with acne scars, I don't even attempt to treat their acne scars until I get their acne under control. Because otherwise you're filling in a tire with air with a hole in it. It's, there's, there's no point in that. You're just chasing your tail. You need to get the acne under control, stop picking, and then treat the acne scars after. Um, next item that you should avoid that for um, um, that, that, that can be bad for your skin is microdermabrasion. So I, again, a lot of the practices where I've worked have microdermabrasion and a lot of my dermatology colleagues still are pro microdermabrasion, but my fellowship director and fellowship taught me this important concept. The follicular ostea, which are those little vellus hair follicles in the skin, which we call pores, are shaped like, a, like, a, like an inverted cone like this. 
when you do micro, I'm oh, sorry, like this. When, when you do microdermabrasion, it cuts the top of the cone off. So basically your pores go from being this wide to this wide. So there's a theory, and we've seen it published in the literature, that when you do microdermabrasion, you take those follicular ostea, and instead of making them narrow to a point, you're opening them up and making them more wide. So I'm actually not a big proponent of, micro, of uh, microdermabrasion. A lot of estheticians do it. I think if it's a very light microdermabrasion, it's fine, but just be wary and don't be too overzealous in your microdermabrasion or have an esthetician who is. Um, Another thing too, another pitfall to avoid is no steroid on your face. So steroids basically are immune modulators which decrease inflammation in the skin. So usually dermatologists use steroids a lot on the skin, usually less than 1% is systemically absorbed because people worry about the systemic effects of steroids. That's not something you have to worry about so much. However, on the face, and you can even just get hydrocortisone 1% from CVS or Rite Aid or a drugstore. You have to be careful because consistent use of steroid on the face is not a good thing. For example, around the eye, it can increase your risk of cataracts. It can increase intraocular pressure, which can increase glaucoma. It can, on your, on your skin, can cause atrophy, which is thinning of the skin, where you get this kind of cigarette paper, like scarring of the skin, which we call in dermatology, where the skin gets really thin and tissue paper-like. You get uh, matted telangiectasia, which are blood vessels in the skin. Steroids can increase uh, angiogenesis. Angio just means blood vessel. Genesis means the formation of. So you get angiogenesis or increased blood vessels in your skin when you use steroids. So uh, a provider may prescribe you a steroid for rosacea or seborrheic dermatitis or some dermatologic condition, but don't get into the pitfall of using steroid consistently on your face because it can have deleterious side effects that I want to protect you from. Um, also, don't frown at your screen. I remember when I was in medical school, that's when I first started doing Botox in my early 20s because I would always be glaring at my computer screen and that creates creases that can have, re that can have wrinkles at rest. You don't want to do that and that's why when um, college students are studying and they're kind of grimacing, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you're relaxing your muscles. That's where we do Botox, even at the young age of in the early 20s. That's when I started because I didn't want those etched in lines from always squinting and grimacing, you know, when you're studying or when you're staring at your computer screen. A lot of people also look up and can make the forehead line. I've almost trained myself not to do that, but either you can Botox that or you can just kind of be aware of it and just try not to animate those facial muscles when you're staring at a computer screen or you're iPad or your phone. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to discuss is hydroquinone. So I did a post on my Instagram story the other day of hydroquinone because I actually suffer with melasma um, and not to get too personal, but I just had to convert to a birth control pill after not being on an IUD anymore because of other issues. But basically when you are on hormones or birth control or you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding or you're postpartum or you're going through IVF, Hormones can induce melasma, and one of the best tools in our armamentarium is hydroquinone. However, a lot of people, because of access to the internet and research that may be unfounded or may scare people because it is not something that you truly need to be afraid of when used correctly and prescribed by an astute physician, hydroquinone is one of your best friends when it comes to melasma and dispigmentation, but you have to use it appropriately and you have to use it as directed by your provider. So hydroquinone is a skin brighten is a skin brightener or lightener. It stops the melanin in the synthesis pathway. So melanocytes, which are pigment producing cells in the skin, if you think of the stepwise synthesis of melanin, there is like a ladder, and basically hydroquinone takes out some of the key components or the key steps in that ladder, so you can't get from point A to point B. So it decreases your melanocytes from making pigment. However, it only decreases the activity of the overzealous, overactive melanocytes. It doesn't do anything to melanocytes that are on a normal, healthy pace. For example, if you're an olive skin complexed um, patient, you don't want to decrease your pigmentation over your whole face just in the areas where you're darker, and that's where hydroquinone comes in. Now, hydroquinone was banned in the UK and in some other countries where data and statistics from lab animals who were ingesting large quantities of it had side effects that we wanted to avoid. To be honest, as dermatologists, when you're using it on a very small body surface area, less than 1% of that gets systemically absorbed, and the side effects aren't something that you 
would have to worry about as much as you would worry about a lab animal who is eating large quantities of it. But there is a real side effect to hydroquinone and the reason why dermatologists, including myself, only give it for short periods of time is because of a phenomenon called ochronosis. Now that's a real phenomenon and if you look under the microscope, they ask us this on our dermatology boards on the histology section, you see these like brown clumps of product in the skin. If you're using a hydroquinone for a very prolonged period of time, over several months, at 4% or higher, it also comes in 6% and 8%, you can get ochronosis, which is paradoxical skin darkening from hydroquinone, which is a skin lightener. So that's the, that's the real concern, and that's why most of my colleagues and I, when we give hydroquinone, we only give it for a finite amount of time, usually three months max, and then we'll take the patient off for you know another three months, or maybe pulse it one month on, one month off, or I had another fellowship director who would do six months on, six months off. So as long as you're giving a, a window break or a holiday in between the treatment, you should be fine. But it's people who use it consistently for months and months and even years, and usually 4% or higher, they can get into trouble. So hydroquinone, when prescribed by a physician in the appropriate way, should be fine, but don't get in the habit of getting it from like Mexico or Canada or getting it off label from some place and using it consistently because you can get yourself into trouble. But on that note, it's not something to be afraid of because it's usually prescribed up to be used as directed by a physician. So that's all I can think of now for things to avoid that can be harmful to your skin. And I'm sure I'll think of a couple more and I'll do another video later. Let me know what you guys want to hear about and thank you so much for your comments and insightful questions and thanks for following.